What's cracking? Welcome back to the HQ, the mecca of grit, aka the house built on big facts only. Your man's just feeling quite gorgeous in every portrait today. That uh, video I put out in overalls, that party's actually happening today in about four hours. So I wanted to get some content up and running. It's Saturday right now. I filmed these on Saturday, put them out on Monday. Since it's Monday, you know what that means. It's in the muck Monday. Today, we're breaking down two running backs being picked within the top 14, 12 picks. Kareem Hunt, Dalvin Cook, Kansas City, Minnesota. It's going to be a good episode. As always, we get in the grit, in the muck on these videos, on these player comparisons. So stay tuned, butter your popcorn, and let's get Jiggy, baby. I'm sure you're wondering where you get that fly-ass shirt. Is it available for sale? Is it one of a kind? Did Javanchi make it for you? No. These are available for sale right now. BigDogsFantasy.com. Link down below. Use promo code, I think Julio, for 11% off. Shout out, Sticks. Oh, my man's Jersey Jungle on Instagram. You head over to his Instagram, the Jersey Jungle. I'm just spelled out, no spaces or anything. The Jersey Jungle. He's got all authentic jerseys, NBA, NFL, MLB, for like $40. If you mention BDGE, you get free shipping. Usually those like Chinese manufacturers do those bullshit authentic jerseys, charge like $20, $30. That's how they get you for shipping. Anyways, yeah, go to Jersey Jungle Instagram. Let them know that I sent you. You'll get free shipping. I got throwback Jamal Anderson Falcons jersey on the way show you guys how it comes out if you are on the fence about ordering from it but i highly suggest you do that so these are available on the, on the site bigdogsfantasy.com the beautiful big facts only shirts if you represent if you if you're with the fame well let's dive into the facts and i want to kind of state this to begin that i think kareem hunt and dalvin cook are both really 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 good running backs I think both of them are players that, uh, you know, I, I like where the NFL is going. And when I say like really good running backs, I don't want, like not every running back within, I would say the top two or three rounds is a running back that I believe is that good. Like for instance, I like Leonard Fournette. I love him in a redraft. He is so highly ranked for me in redraft. That's because his volume and his situation, being on a great team, the great offensive line, added Andrew Norwell. They're trying to match the quarterback. They have a great defense who's going to set them up with a lot of scoring opportunities. Uh, I love him in redraft, but I'm not sure that if you put Leonard Fournette in another situation outside of Jacksonville and maybe like one or two teams, he would have anywhere near the draft value that he has, in my opinion, for redraft leagues this year. That being said, guys like Dalvin Cook and Kareem Hunt are extremely, extremely good running backs. And it's kind of pointing towards the way the NFL is working nowadays, where not everyone needs to draft and try to get a running back that looks like Adrian Peterson on their team. Because these are guys who win through intangibles and that X factor, right? They have great balance, burst, agility, and, and vision, and one-cut ability. And these things that you can't necessarily measure at the combine, or you can't look at a player and realize that they have that. But the NFL is getting, you know, the more analytical they get and the more information they get on these types of running backs who are able to actually win games for your team. These are the running backs that are starting to become the more prototype running backs in the NFL, the ones that could do it all. Not so much 6'2", 225, sub 6% body fat. You don't need to be that build in order to succeed. And that's why I'm glad that these running backs are starting to get more and more play time. And normally they wouldn't even be given a chance just based on how they kind of looked and how they measured out and things like that. Teams are just getting smarter. They realize that Cook and Hunt are the type of guys you want. They're saying like, fuck a spark score. We want yards, more. Damn, I might drop a freestyle at this party. Oh, my vlogs are so coming back. They're coming back today, starting today. So any of y'all that were watching my vlogs for the last 67 weeks, we bike. Anywho, both of them is nice. Doesn't always equate into fantasy niceness. So, as we always do, we're about to get in the muck. We're about to get down and see which of the two you should draft in fantasy football. Right now, Dalvin Cook is going off the board. 14th overall, running back 10. Kareem Hunt is 10th overall, running back 18. In my rankings, I have Dalvin Cook as overall 17 RB10. Kareem Hunt overall 19 RB11. Let's start off with my mains, Kareem Hunt in Kansas City. All right, so we got Kareem the Dream Hunt. Chiefs picked him last year, third round out of Toledo. Now, he entered the offseason. There was a lot of hype around him. A lot of people liked him. Some people like Spencer Waremore, the Chiefs camp, so he liked him. There was a lot of buzz, a lot of news about how they were using him in the first team. He was in a camp battle with Spencer Ware before Spencer Ware eventually fucked up all his CLs, the 
LCL, the PCL, the MCL, the ACL. I lied about that. I'm not really sure which ones it was. I think it was the LCL and the PCL. I think I have it right. Yeah, PCL and LCL, he ended up completely destroying. So he was out for the year, giving Kareem Hunt the starting role indefinitely. And he just ran away with the job, man. He did. It was that first, first, first game against the Patriots. It was like the first NFL game of 2017. Pats were expected to destroy the Chiefs, led by Alex Smith. That did not happen. Kareem Hunt went bonkers. But with his first touch, he ended up fumbling the ball. And as like Twitter football does, they relegated him back to the NCAA. They're like, you're done in the NFL. You're a bust. And I was like, Zam, honestly, because I had been, I was like draft, 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 draft. People were like Kareem Hunt in third and third. I was like, dude, that is the best value you can get right now for a running back. That's big facts only. He fumbled it and I was a little nervous to be honest with you, but he would go on to absolutely murk that game. He went off for 246 total yards. That is on 17 rush attempts, five catches, three tutties on the night. The NFL officially knew who Kareem Hunt was. He would end up kind of having a roller coaster season in 2017. He did end up winning the NFL rushing title. Todd Gurley had 1,305 yards. Kareem Hunt would finish with 1,327 yards. So he was 22 yards ahead of Todd Gurley, who sat out the final game because they were resting their starters. So put an asterisk there. But in reality, he won the rushing title as a rookie, which is still a very impressive feat. Um, he would go on to, like I said, rush for 1,327 yards, eight tutties, 272 carries, which equates out to a 4.9 Yads Pekari, he would add 455 yards and three tutties on 53 catches. So he would finish as running back four overall, running back five in points per game, 16.8 fantasy points per game in half PPR leagues. His 4.9 yards per carry was fourth among NFL running backs behind only Kamara, Deion Lewis, and Mark Ingram. His 3.1 yards after contact was sixth. He led the NFL in tackles evaded per pro football focus. He evaded 61 tackles, which was not even close to the next guy. Melvin Gordon was the next leading one at 48. So Kareem Hunt was a monster. Evaded 0.22 tackles per attempt, which was the third highest efficiency metric per PFF. Now, when you look at player profile, there is a lot of goodness here. He was also number one in evaded tackles per player profile is juke rate, which is uh, tackles evaded per run was number two breakaway run rate, which is rushes of 15 plus yards. He was number one in breakaway runs, sixth in run rate, dominator ratings up there, yards created, yards created. All I'm saying is he was just mad good. Lastly, if we look at the NFL next gen stats, he is his quote unquote per their website. He averaged 4.63 yards after defenders closed within one yard of him, leading all backs with 175 plus carries. A lot of goodness. But what was weird about the season, as I mentioned, it was kind of a roller coaster year. We're in the middle of the year. After scoring six touchdowns in the first three games, which we knew obviously was a, an unsustainable rate, he went scoreless over the Chiefs' next nine games. So nine games in a row, he did not score a touchdown. I think that's more of an unlucky thing. Um, so I don't really look at that as a huge red flag, considering he went for more than 100 total yards in four of those nine games and he caught three passes in every single one of them except for one of them so it wasn't like he was necessarily just horrible throughout that he just had unlucky touchdown games it was a lot in a row and i understand that but he was still pretty good from other aspects of the game you look at how he finished the year as well over the last five games including playoffs he went nuts going over 100 yards in a bunch of them uh, he scored in every single one of those last five games and he scored six times overall in those five games so Although he had that weird stretch in the middle, it's not like it had he ended the year going like 10 games in a row without a, without a touchdown going into this year, you'd be a little nervous, but he went off at the end of the year. So not like crazy nervous about him as in terms of like scoring touchdowns and stuff. Again, though, you know, in the muck, I always talk about the good, the good part of the player, but then I also look at the bad part and why I'm nervous about Kareem Hunt. I've been touting him as a great running back. He finished the year strong. What's the problem? My concern with him is is not as a running back, it is everything to do with Andy Reid's coaching style, his play calling, and his personnel usage. That is my concern when it comes to Kareem Hunt. I wanna take a look at this chart. Now I know there's a lot of numbers and it might end up being really small on your screens. I'll kind of dive into you and just listen to me. You don't have to look at the numbers now. If you wanna pause your screen and look at it, you could do that. So what I did was basically went all the way back to 2010, looking at 2010 to 2017, the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I discluded 
2011, because I think that was the year Jamal Charles tore his ACL and they just had like a bunch of backup running backs kind of playing for them. What I wanted to see was how much work the RB1 got in Andy Reid offenses uh, relative to the RB2 and relative to the entire backfield as a whole. So it's basically showing the percentage of carries, the percentage of receptions, the percentage of overall touches that the RB1 has gotten in these Chiefs offenses under Andy Reid. When you look at 2017, it's the last column all the way to the right on the chart. You see a lot of green and a lot of red. So strong data points all the way over there. And these are the numbers that stick out to me concern-wise. Kareem Hunt, that first number that's in green right there, that's very, very, very green. Kareem Hunt saw 87% of the carries in the Chiefs offense last year. That's a number higher than any we've seen in an Andy Reid offense, even with Jamal Charles there being the lead back. I looked all the way back to 2006 when Larry Johnson had that year where he had 416 carries. Not even that was really close to that 87% carry rate that Kareem Hunt saw last year. His 80% touch mark, Kareem Hunt's last year, was the highest over the last eight years. Probably farther back because I didn't look at every number when it goes all the way back to 2006, but 80% of the touches, 87% of the carries is by far the highest number for an Andy Reid offense, for an RB1 in the offense. And you see the RB2 carries, which is right below all the green. You see a lot of red. Those uh, 6% of the carries went to the RB2 there, where over the last seven years, you could see 28% went to the RB2, 21%, 38%, 21%, 19%, 49% over the last seven or so years. So this was an extremely, extremely outlier of a year in terms of touches for the RB1. One, and you have to assume, given the history, that it's that it was because Spencer Ware went down and they didn't have a backup outside of Charkendrick West, who's not a runner, really. He's just kind of like a, not a gadget player, but he's much more suited to just play on third down and, and in like two-minute drills and, and things like that. So ultimately, it comes down to the fact that I'm not sure I see Kareem Hunt getting anywhere near that carry rate of 87% in 2000. 18. Now, we haven't really been updated much on Spencer Ware and the injury because this is a long injury he's got to recover from because he tore multiple things. But I was looking at his Instagram the other day and he's posting videos where he's working out and working through the ladders and he's shifting laterally very well, like really far side to side. So the knee looks perfectly intact and he looks like he's ready to go. And you look back at Ware, and I'm not saying he was like an elite back. When he was the only back there, he was an RB1 in fantasy um, and he's a perfectly good RB2 in, in real life football. So I really think that he's going to eat into that work a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised to see if we go back to the chart, you know, the RB2s have seen anywhere from 20 to 40% of the running back carries. Now I do believe obviously Hunt is going to get a huge majority of that, but Ware is probably going to see somewhere between 20 and 25% of the running back carries, which is going to to eat into Hunt's workload uh, pretty much. The other thing is what happens on the goal line, right? Where is a much bigger back? Where is pushing 225 or 230? Hunt is like 215 pounds. Now it's amazing that Hunt actually finished as high as he did in fantasy considering he only saw six goal line carries on the year. So we had the six most overall carries in the NFL last year with 287, but only six of those were goal line carries, which is 24th in the NFL. So it seems to me like they don't really want to run the ball down there or they don't want to give Kareem Hunt the carries down there. That six goal line carries was as many as Thomas Rawls, Orleans Darkwa. Like I said, Spencer Ware has 15 pounds on Hunt and Spencer Ware actually saw nine goal line carries in 2016 despite playing in two less games that season than Hunt played last year. So seems like Ware is a part of that goal line process for the Chiefs and wouldn't surprise me to see him take a lot of those away from Hunt in 2018. So Hunt scores 11 total touchdowns last year on six goal line carries. So Four of his 11 touchdowns came from 35 yards or farther. That's the type of shits that give me trust issues, people. You can't rely on those long touchdowns year over year. Now, there are players who can make it happen, but for you to draft a player or to rely on a majority of his touchdowns to come from 35 yards or farther, I could understand if it was like 20 to 25 yards, but 35 yards or farther are touchdowns that you cannot, you can't chase that and redraft because you'll never be able to correctly predict if those things are coming. So if uh, you can't rely on those touchdowns year over year and the fact that Spencer Ware might take a portion of these goal line carries. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there's definitely a red flag for me for when it comes to Kareem Hunt in, in that sense of things. And while we're at it, this is a team like Green Bay that passes the ball a ton in the red zone. Over the last two seasons, they've ran the sixth highest percentage of pass plays in the red zone, 59%. And they aren't a high volume team overall in the red zone. I think people assume they are because 
their offense is always super efficient and they end up being a good team overall but that's not the case actually i was looking at evan silva's kansas city chiefs team previews uh, where he puts the play rank, the play volume rank for each of the teams. So the total number of offensive plays over the last four years, starting with 2014, their ranks 29th, 31st, 27th, 24th. So they don't run a lot of plays. Like I'm saying, my, my concern for Hunt already is the volume and the fact that he got such a high percentage. And now you look at the fact that the Chiefs aren't a team that really runs that many plays. That kind of scares me. They get your boy Ware back. They bring in the Williams brothers, Damian Williams from the Dolphins. Kerwin Williams coming in. And they got Charmander West signed for Uno Mas years. They don't want to end up in a situation where they did last year, giving Kareem Hunt 90% of the carries because they don't have other running back options. Now they do. And they did it as insurance. I'm not, I don't think any of them are seriously going to eat into his workload that much, but it's interesting nonetheless. A few more things to touch on when it comes to Hunt's outlook. Their offensive line graded out well. They were 12th in run blocking per football outsiders last year, 12th per pro football focus and yards, prefer, uh, yards before contact for running back. So I don't think that's really a concern here. They do have a change in offense coordinator. Matt Nagy, who was the offense coordinator left, he's going to be the head coach in Chicago. Eric Benimi takes over as the offensive coordinator here in Kansas City. He's been their running backs coach in Kansas City for the last five years or so, since 2013. So I don't really think the play calling is going to change much. I think Andy Reid is still going to have his pulse on all the plays that are pretty much run, and he's going to be the one that decides, you know, the personnel and a lot of the play calling. So um, even if it is Benimi having a much bigger impact, he is a running backs coach. So it's not really going to affect Hunt that much, in my opinion. Lastly, of course, we have to talk about the quarterback change. So we had Alex Smith, who was super efficient. Now we go over to Patrick Mahomes. He's stepping in as a new face of the franchise. The only thing I would say is, like, what happens if Patrick Mahomes is not the guy everyone thinks he is? Or he doesn't live up to the expectations right away of what we think he is. The way people are drafting in fantasy football is of the certainty that Patrick Mahomes is a beast. You have... A top 10 pick in Kareem Hunt. You have a top 25 tight end pick in Travis Kelsey. A top 30 pick in Tyreek Hill. So heavy, 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 heavy draft capital. If Patrick Mahomes isn't amazing this year, then you're looking at one, if not two of these players disappointing. And the only one I'm comfortable taking at their current ADP, would, I don't want to do this, but if I had to choose one of those three guys, it would be Kelsey. I think he is a fixture in this offense no matter what. I think there's a really good chance Tariq Kill disappoints at his ADP. I think there's a very realistic chance that Kareem Hunt disappoints at his ADP of a top 10 pick right now. And again, I think it's I don't think it's because he's bad. I think it's because he won't get enough volume in this Chiefs offense to be a high-end uh, running back one in fantasy. So if Mahomes doesn't come out and ball like everyone expects him to, then there's going to be some problem. There's going to be some disappointment in this Chiefs offense. And I think that's something we see anytime there's a shiny new toy in town, people are get overly optimistic about it when it comes to fantasy football. And I think that's what we're seeing with the Chiefs. So let's dive into my man's Dalvin Cook. Like Hunt, I think Dalvin Cook is a much, much, much better runner than a lot of running backs in the NFL. Dalvin Cook was a guy who reminded me so much of Devonta Freeman coming out of college. They both went to Florida State, both have that smaller type body building frame. I don't know, I didn't mean bodybuilding frame, I meant like built body frame. Y'all know what I'm talking about, so I'm just going to continue on with my points here. And he wins through the intangibles again, like being able to find the crease, being a one cut back, having good balance and vision and, and all these things. And that's how he wins. Now, towards ACL last year in week four, four weeks into the 2017 season, he was a beast prior to the injury though, through four weeks. Actually, it wasn't even a full four weeks because he got hurt in that fourth week. He rushed for 354 yards, two touchdowns on 74 carries. He added 11 catches and 90 yards on 16 targets. So you're looking at 22 and a half opportunities per game. So I mean, carries plus targets and 111 total yards from scrimmage per game for Cook in those first four weeks. He also got tackled on the one yard line of one of his receptions last year. So he should have had three touchdowns instead of four touchdowns. So you're looking at people being even more optimistic about him. His 4.8 yards per carry on those rush attempts ranked sixth for all running backs with over 70 carries, which is a 58 running back sample size last year. So 4.8 yards per carry was sixth in the NFL. His 2.6 yards after contact was good. It wasn't amazing, but still above average, which is good to see for a guy that's not huge. He's 5'10", 210 pounds. So he's, if he's going to be one of those guys that keeps grinding it out and gets those extra yards, that means the coaching staff is going to want him in on all rushing plays, whether it's, you know, to get that third and one run or maybe on the goal line, which we'll talk about in a second. Don't mistake that size for being weak, right? 210 pounds. He did put up 22 reps like your man's on the bench press at the combine. So he's small, but he's definitely not weak. It was so clear how involved they wanted to get him in their game 
plan. The question now we need to answer is now that he's coming off the ACL and he missed that entire year and they did they were super productive without him uh, from a running back standpoint, does he get the same volume? Is the game plan the same? Do they want to keep feeding Dalvin Cook when they have a guy like Latavius Murray in the backfield? Now, I made this chart. I wanted to look at, you know, weeks one through four, what the Vikings tendencies were and without Cook, five through 17, what their tendencies were and if anything changed. So the percentage of offensive plays where they were running the ball with Cook in there, 44%, which was 12th highest in the NFL, went to 46%, which was fifth highest in the NFL, which is kind of interesting because they were running the ball less with Cook. But then when I looked at the percentage of their pass, you know, obviously if they're rushing the ball less, then they're passing the ball more. But I looked at the percentage of targets that went to the running back position while Cook was the main guy there. And it was at 24%, which was ninth highest in the NFL. So although they ran the ball a little bit less with Cook in the lineup, they passed the ball to him way more when he was in the lineup. So overall, you could see they were getting their running backs involved heavily, regardless of who was back there. So Cook getting the ball a little bit more in the passing game, which is good because Jarek McKinnon's out. So Cook is the only pass catching back really left there in Minnesota who's going to get a ton of those looks. Now, over those last 12 weeks, weeks 5 through 17, Latavius Murray and Jarek McKinnon combined for 342 touches, 56 of them being receptions. Uh, there, or wait, was it 342 carries plus 56 receptions? Let me fact check that real quick. Oh, whoever won the PFF Edge package did not hit me back up. So someone else is going to be in line to win that package. I'll announce it on my in my next video. We got some cool guests coming on the show soon. You guys are going to be pumped when I tell you who it is. Oh, so okay. So they combined for 342 carries plus 56 receptions. So you're looking at a lot of running back touches in just a 12-week span. There were a bunch of teams. So they had 342 carries combined, right? Those two in those 12 weeks. There were a bunch of teams I was looking at, the Dolphins, the Lions, Raiders, Bengals, Browns, Packers, Bucks, Giants, that barely had more total rushing attempts, team rushing attempts on the season than those 342 carries those two running backs combined for in 12 weeks. And those rushing attempts include all of their running backs in the backfield, quarterback rushes, if they had any wide receiver rushes, whatever. So super high volume rushing offense for Minnesota in just those 12 weeks. A lot of work to be had in that backfield. Now, there are a few pieces of the puzzle that need to be answered when it comes to this Vikings team and the backfield overall. Number one, concern. There's obviously Kirk Cousins as the new quarterback. Number two, they have a new offensive coordinator in John DeFilippo. Three, poor offensive line. Four, Latavius Murray's role in this offense. We'll start with Kirk Cousins. I don't really think Kirk Cousins being there is going to affect his outlook whatsoever. Case Keenum was great last year in a vacuum. Kirk Cousins is better than Case Keenum is. So even uh, with Keenum playing to his great strengths last year, Kirk Cousins is going to put up similar numbers, probably better numbers. So I don't think it's a hit. If anything, it's probably an upgrade for Dalvin Cook because the defenses can't uh, stack the box or anything. Number two, we have their new offensive coordinator, John DeFilippo. He is the former quarterback coach for the Eagles. So he was pretty damn good getting Wentz to become what he became last year. Now, obviously, that's not all on him. There's a lot of good coaches there that can take credit for that. But he also helped Nick Foles, you know, to that playoff run and whatnot. So he was he was good as a quarterback's coach. He was the OC in Cleveland two years ago. Uh, so that wasn't uh, that's not something that you really are proud of having on your resume. But it's hard to look at. What I want to look back at when you get a new offensive coordinator is their play calling tendencies, which you can't look at from two years ago in Cleveland considering how bad they were. The game script was awful. So what they had going on there last year was obviously skewed by the fact that they didn't weren't able to establish a run game. So we can't really look at it. What I did find interesting was while they were filling this OC role, the other guys that they interviewed were quarterbacks coaches. Most of the most of the interviews that they conducted for their OC spot were other quarterbacks coaches. So uh, it tells you that they're really trying to bring someone in to help Kirk Cousins and bring Kirk Cousins to the next level. What that says in my mind is it, it might be leaning a little bit more towards a pass friendly offense this year and giving Kirk a little more leeway and a little more leash than, than Case Keenum got last year. And to be honest with you, that's not a downgrade in my opinion, because as I said before, Dalvin Cook is going to be the main pass catching back in this offense. 
So if you bring in someone to make this team a little more pass friendly, I think that just means more volume in the passing game for Dalvin Cook, which is always a good thing in fantasy football because targets and receptions are almost three times more valuable in fantasy than running back carries. So big fan of whatever coaching changes they made to this Vikings team. Cook's outlook is good from a passing game standpoint. And when you bring in a guy who's trying to take Kirk to the next level, you look at Kirk, what he did last year, right? He loves throwing to his running backs. Look at what him and Chris Thompson had in that small sample size last year. So uh, I think that's a good thing for for Dalvin Cook. And now you look at the offensive line, which is number three in these factors I was talking about. That is definitely a concern. They were 19th per Football Outsiders in run blocking. They were 20th in yards before contact per PFF. PFF's new 2018 offensive line rankings heading into 2018. They have them ranked 28th overall. But if you look at their numbers last year, like I said, 19th and 20th in run blocking, that was actually pretty big improvements from 2016 into 2017. So they're headed in the right direction is what that tells me. They did invest their second round pick into Brian O'Neill, an offensive tackle out of Pittsburgh. So if anything, that's a plus. I'm not too, too worried about this offensive line because as I said, they made incremental improvements from 2016 to 2017. So hopefully we could see that happen again. Um, and we saw Devlin Cook be a beast with the offensive line they had last year. So not really a, a concern to me. So while it was a huge glaring weakness in you know last year's outlook, it's not so much this year. Lastly, and by far my biggest concern when it comes to Dalvin Cook is Latavius Murray's role in this offense. And we're not really sure what it's going to be. Now, Dalvin Cook won that one. He was going to win the job last year because he's a much better running back than Latavius Murray overall. But Latavius Murray was hurt last year during training camp. So he didn't have any time. He didn't. He wasn't able to com compete with Cook for those early down work role. Uh, they gave it to Cook and he ran away with the job, of course, in those first four weeks. But his role this year. Now, regardless of what you think about Latavius Murray, regardless of his efficiency and what you think about him as a running back, man, the guy can get in the end zone. The guy is a good goal line rusher. He scored 20 rushing touchdowns over the last two seasons with Minnesota and with Oakland. He did it with the Raiders. He did it with the Vikings, man. He could do it with whatever team puts him in the situation. They pounded the rock with him on the goal line last year. And I mean, at 6'2", 225 pounds, there's no reason not to do it, right? He's a big guy who can get in there and score for them. He's just an easy weapon for them to use. He's converted 15 of 29 rushes inside the five yard line into touchdowns over the last two years, which is a more effective rate than most NFL running backs. I don't think it's going to affect Cook's workload in terms of early down work between the 20s and certainly not in the receiving game, but it's uh, it's a red flag to me that he might lose the goal line work. But the good thing about it is like Cook's a guy who can score from any part of the field, and he's a guy I see getting a lot of goal line receptions. Like, I actually think a large majority of his touchdowns are going to come from like five yards to 20 yards. He's a guy who, if they continue to rush in the red zone like they have been, they're a very high rushing volume team when it comes to the red zone he can break away those runs because he's so nifty in tight spaces he's not like that's that's the good part about guys like cook and hunt they work well in the end zone that's why you see guys like antonio brown and odell beckham continually be able to put up high touchdown totals because when you get in that part of the field right the defenses get tighter things get a lot more difficult and you really have that's like when you play basketball right when you play half court basketball you're playing pickup with your friends the players who are good at half court basketball are the ones who's got good handles and the ones who can work tight in space and that's where you see guys like Dalvin Cook, Kareem Hunt, Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham really good at gaining separation and really good in tight spaces those are the real legit playmakers and that's where I see with Dalvin Cook and I see him a guy that can you know get in from 10 yards out, 15 yards out, where guy who just relies on his speed and, and big holes in that aren't as successful because it's much harder to get those holes in, in the red zone area. So my only concern, my biggest concern is Latavius Murray's role. Now, I, like I said, I think both guys, to, to wrap this up really, I think both guys are excellent running backs and I think they're gonna have extremely efficient years. And if they bust, it's going to be purely based on volume. I mean, Minnesota is a team whose running backs caught 84 passes last year. So if Cook is going to be the very, very primary pass catcher in that offense, he can easily hit 65 to 70 and eat in that sense. So when it comes down to it, man, personally, uh, I think the Minnesota offense is going to be a lot better than Kansas City's offense. Um, I mean, Kansas City obviously has the upside, but who is more likely to have that good offense? That's Minnesota for sure for me. They're going to be controlling the ball a lot. They have a great defense, which is going to set up great field position for them. The Kansas City defense is going to be terrible, which means more time off the clock, right? A lot of people use that kind of 
narrative and there's like, oh, bad defense means a lot of points and blah, blah, blah. But that also means if you have a bad defense, the offense is driving on you and eating up a lot of time of possession. So that's something that we're not going to see with Cook. They're go- they're going to be the ones controlling the time of possession. So Cook is ahead of Cream Hunt for me. He's the winner in this in the muck Monday. But as you can see by my rankings, right, like 17 and 19, that's where they're ranked for me. So while I have Cook ahead, he's not someone I see that I want to necessarily jump at because in these first two rounds, there are a lot of like surefire kind of guys. Um, And that means taking a wide receiver if you need to ahead of these guys. Like I'm not taking Cook or Hunt ahead of those elite. The, The second tier of wide receivers is super elite still, right? Between Julio, Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, if you, I'd put Devonta Adams in there, but some of you guys don't want to do that. But I'm saying like, you can get Julio, Thomas, Keenan Allen, Devonta Adams in the same spot that you can get Dalvin Cook or Kareem Hunt. So I would take those wide receivers before I would take the running backs because in the first few rounds of your fantasy drafts, like the first two rounds, every player is going to be really good and all of them have really good floors and ceilings and all this stuff. I think it's a smart idea to minimize risk in those first two rounds because you can't necessarily win with the first two rounds because everyone's picks are going to be high upside players, but you can certainly lose. If you start taking players with a lot of risk baked into, you know, into their outlook, then that, that's risky. And so that's that's really the point I guess I'm trying to get across here with both of these guys is I'm a little nervous about that, but I would take Cook because I'm feel, I feel safer about his workload overall. So that's going to be it for this episode. If you enjoyed, as always, give this video a thumbs up, please. It, uh, it's super appreciated by myself along with the rest of the along with the rest of the team back here. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We will do In The Muck Mondays every single Monday. Wednesday's video is, I forget what Wednesday's video is, but I, I think it's a good one. I already finished a blog post for it. So I will see y'all on the next episode. We got some good guests coming on. We got a, a Thursday episode this week, I think, because I did a podcast last night that I videotaped. I'm gonna put it on the channel for y'all. And uh, and that's it. So uh, much love. Enjoy your, enjoy your weekends. I'm ready to go put on some damn overalls, drink some margaritas, and have a, have a goddamn day. <laughs>